Luigi Russolo, 1885-1947, was well into a successful painting career when he turned to music in his 1913 Manifesto The Art of Noises, L'Art dei Rumori. Announcing an intention to enlarge and enrich the field of sound, the futurist polymath waxed poetic about the modern city's sonic landscape, the throbbing of valves, the bustle of pistons, and the shrieks of mechanical saws. Point one four. Rousselot, the noisy nature of everyday industrializing. Europe offered new ways of perceiving the acoustic world and a means of shaking concert music loose from its stagnant orchestral roots. With significant help from his assistant, Ugo Piatti, Rousselot set out to put these ideas into practice, working day and night to achieve the great ideal of a complete orchestra of noise instruments. In Tona Rumori.2 within three months, they had built their first creation, a burster, scopiator, and premiered it before an audience of 2000 at Teatro Storci in Modena, Italy. Meant to mimic a car engine's sputter, the instrument, by all appearances a simple wooden box with an enormous speaker cone attached, had a playable range between two octaves, modulated by a crank and lever. Three. This burster was soon followed by a hummer, a rubber, which evoked spatulas scraping rusty pans, and the crackler, a sonic chimera sounding like something between a mandolin and a machine gun. Little remains today of Rousselot's instruments beyond scattered diagrams and photographs, which have been used on multiple occasions to create playable replicas. Aside from a fragment of the score for Risveglio di Una, Cheetah, none of Rousselot's compositions for the Intona Rumori survive. Yet, miraculously, two gramophone recordings were produced by Rousselot and his brother Antonio in 1921 and have been successfully preserved. Five in these grainy time capsules, the Antona Rumori seemed to be in conflict with one another, battling for sonic space alongside traditional instruments, at what sounds like the end of a long tunnel. In Corale, an asinine, plodding orchestral score is rendered unsettling by the violent roar of an unidentifiable machine. Serenata features even less of the Antona Rumori, but their occasional presence turns a sentimental serenade of strings and woodwinds into a carnivalesque nightmare. Tempered by the presence of instruments from the past and by the limits of contemporary technology, the noise intoners nevertheless make their intense energy felt through Rousselot's soundscapes. In an interview some 40 years after his 1915 encounter with the music of the Italian futurists, composer Igor Stravinsky recalled the event as at best, an intriguing oddity. On one of my Milanese visits Marinetti and Russolo, a genial quiet man but with wild hair and beard, and Pratella, another noisemaker, put me through a demonstration of their futurist music. Five phonographs standing on five tables in a large and otherwise empty room emitted digestive noises, static, etc. I pretended to be enthusiastic and told them that sets of five phonographs with such music, mass-produced, would surely sell like Steinway grand pianos. Stravinsky's reaction was mild when compared to that of the international press. One correspondent for a Paris newspaper described a concert of the Intona Rumori as an impressive a simultaneity of bloody faces and noisy and harmonics in an infernal din. Point seven. Yet the musical inventions of Rousselot did not fail to find admirers. Indeed, the composer Edgar Vérez was highly enthusiastic about Rousselot's musical and theoretical works, as were later composers such as Pierre Schaeffer and John Cage, and visual artists like Pete Mondrian. What was still unknown to Stravinsky in 1915, however, would become common knowledge by the mid-20th century, the sonic revolution that Rousselot and his fellow futurists sought was uneasily compatible with the ritualized, martial violence celebrated by Italian fascism. We shall sing the great masses shaken with work, pleasure, or rebellion, we shall sing the multicolored and polyphonic tidal waves of revolution in the modern metropolis, shall sing the vibrating nocturnal fervor of factories and shipyards burning under violent electrical moons, bloated railroad stations that devour smoking serpents, factories hanging from the sky by the twisting threads of spiraling smoke, the oscillating flight of airplanes, whose propeller flaps at the wind like a flag and seems to applaud like a delirious crowd. It was a boundless, assumption-shattering, 
and violence courting energy that Marinetti projected from this first statement of his futurist ideals, a compulsive vitality that aimed to shock the modern urbanite out of blasé complacency, reinvigorating their senses to confront the wonders of a new century with open eyes and ears. Marinetti was trying to rally Europe's aesthetes to a shining new cause, noise, speed, power, futurism. By celebrating action and movement, writes Luciano Cessa, Marinetti's aesthetics celebrated the energy manifested in every vibration of the cosmos, that is, energy itself. Four years after this manifesto, Russolo fashioned a tract of his own in The Art of Noises, which recounts a trench letter, sent by Marinetti during the First Balkan War, in which the sounds of combat create the orchestra of a great battle. Building on this image, Russolo lays out a map of his mechanical philharmonic, where the intona rumori are classed by families of sound. Roars, thunderings, explosions, bangs, and booms belong to his first category, while shouts, screams, shrieks, wails, hoots, howls, death rattles, and sobs compose category 6.14 This taxonomy governed both the spatial organization of the intona rumori on stage and the methodology behind their construction, a process that drew on significant technical skill, fine-tuned through numerous failed experiments, in order to intone, in Rousselot's words, diverse noises, regulating them harmonically and rhythmically. The intona rumori's roots in the sound of battle were far from incidental, the fetishization of war was central to futurist ideals. 16 Many were willing to accept and encourage a certain amount of destruction to clear the way for, in Bocconi's words, smashing the chronometric tyranny of rhythm, celebrating violence, in the studio and on the streets, as both an intense expulsion of energy and a means of furthering their cause. 17 Marinetti announced the futurists' intention to glorify war, the world's only hygiene, militarism, patriotism, the destructive gesture of freedom bringers, beautiful, ideas worth dying for, and scorn for woman. Point one eight. Whereas Protella advocated a merely theoretical break with the artistic past, Marinetti called for these sentiments to be taken to their ultimately physical conclusions, exhorting his acolytes to destroy museums, libraries, and universities. 19 Although his machismo and misogyny could be construed as posturing, Marinetti's militancy had much in common with, and helped shape, emerging strains of revolutionary and reactionary politics. A volatile blend of modern science, mass media, fine art, poetry, and insurrection, Marinetti's vision resonated with a generation of artists who, as Rousselot and others wrote in Manifesto of the Futurist Painters, wished to express the violent desire that stirs in the veins of every creative artist today, a desire that led many to sympathize with the devastating forces of fascism. At the beginning of the third piece, an extraordinary thing happens, Marinetti, Boccioni, Armando Mazzi, and Piatti vanish from the stage, emerge from the empty orchestra pit, run across it, and hurl themselves among the seats, assaulting the many pastistes, now drunk with the rage of tradition and imbecility, with blows, slaps, and cudgels, the battle in the orchestra lasts about half an hour, while the imperturbable Luigi Russolo continues to direct his orchestra of noise instruments. Soon afterwards, the orchestral performers themselves get in on the fray, half keep the intona rumori running, pulling their levers and turning their wheels like a frantic submarine crew, while the other half battles the audience. Yet the bloodshed courted by Marinetti and the futurists was far from random, they aestheticized violence to such a degree that what occurred in the seats was merely an extension of what took place on stage. In the wake of the First World War, this artistic experiment began to seep deeper into public life. During June, 1919, Marinetti co-authored yet another manifesto, Il Manifesto dei Fasci Italiani di Combattimento, commonly referred to as the Fascist Manifesto. Marinetti's involvement with Italian fascism is unsurprising when we consider his preoccupation with the volatility of crowds, celebration of public violence, and vision of national renewal through bloodshed. The role of art under Mussolini, argues Roger Griffin, was to act as a source of the regenerative myths needed to forge a vital new communitas, the national community, out of a moribund society, to inform the spirit of fascism's spiritual government. Point two seven. Despite numerous critical attempts to exculpate futurist noise from fascist politics, 
Sonic Discord could easily become the soundtrack of authoritarianism. Noise served as the perfect emblem of this violence, Christine Poggi writes, which Marinetti and the other futurists wished to unleash, if only to rechannel it to nationalist aims. Although Rousselot never explicitly identified as a fascist, he was by no means immune to the darker strains in Marinetti's vision. During Mussolini's reign, Rousselot's work was involved in two state sponsored arts exhibits one at Turin's Quadriennale in May 1927 and one at Milan's Pesaro Gallery in October 1929.29 at the Turin exhibit, works by Bal, Anton Giulio Brugolia, and Rousselot, among others, were billed as Arta Fascista. These signs of collaboration and complicity with Mussolini's regime have been covered up in Rousselot's scholarship to such a degree that earlier critics, such as Giovanni Lister, termed him explicitly anti-fascist. In the introduction to his French translation of Rousselot's The Art of Noises, Lister claims, on the basis of post-war testimonies, that Rousselot left Italy for Paris in 1927 explicitly to protest fascism. 30 Yet even if Rousselot's involvement with fascist exhibitions were to be ignored, his close involvement with Marinetti and his participation in the violence courting rituals of futurist aesthetic practice throw Lister's designation into question. Indeed, attempting to separate Rousselot and other politically ambivalent futurists from the more explicit evils of their fascist colleagues is a difficult, if not futile, exercise.